Welcome, welcome to Better Pickleball. We got to ask me anything with uh, Tony Roy from Into Pickle coming up. Hope you're having a great night. My name is CJ Johnson and um, this channel, Better Pickleball, is dedicated to helping you play at pickleball players over 50 live your best lives on and off the pickleball court. So give me just a second here. I'm going to check my tech and I want to jump into the chat here. I know Tony's been in the chat already and hey Dale, if you can just give me a heads up and let me know that we're going live and you're seeing the stream, that whole bit, that would be fantastic. Would appreciate that. All right. Hello. We got Lori Gray. She gave us a nice big old smile. And Jim, Jim Rink, tell us where you are calling from or watching from this evening, actually. That would be fantastic. I'm going to do one more thing here. Uh, give me just a second. All righty. I got Tony waiting. He's actually already here, which is a good thing, but definitely had a little tech issue tonight. YouTube made some changes to the studio since the last time that I, <clears throat> that I was on live, which is the first Tuesday of every month. And that's what this coincides with. So I've got Tony, as I said, coming in tonight. Don't forget, I have another one coming up November. It'll be November 2nd. We're going to have a YouTube live. So make sure that you tune in for our next special guest. We are working on that. I know you're going to have a lot of questions for Tony. So when you have a question, we have our lovely Dale Cassell here with us tonight. She always helps me out. Thank you, Dale. I appreciate your help. Um, this would be so much more difficult to do if... Um, if you weren't here to help us. So she is gonna be in the chat. If you have a question, please do us a favor, put the word Q or question, the word Q, the letter Q, <laughs> or a question in front of your question so that we know it's a question. That makes it way easier for us. So let's see, we got Sandy from Northern California. Hello, Sandy and Barry, <clears throat> excuse me. And then of course we got David and Dale, Dale Voigt's here. Hello, Dale and Stan from Birmingham. Hello, Stan, how are you? So everybody's piling in. I'm not gonna take any more of your time. Um, I am going to go right ahead here and let me bring in Tony. Hello, Tony. You gotta turn your mic on. What's now. happening, CJ and everybody, hello. <laughs> how are you this evening, Tony? Oh, I am good. I got a little bit of a histamine thing going on today, so I may be a little bit stuffy, and I'm drinking my uh, my little tea. There's no no alcohol in here for sure, and I'm having my. I was gonna. I told everybody, CJ, I was gonna share my my tip to good pickleball, and there it is, right there. Well, Danish uh, Danish cookies. You got to eat these uh, at least three or four a night, and you'll be a much better pickleball player. Half a level increase improvement. Okay, so after you eat all his Danish pickleball cookie thingies, then you can come back and we'll go to work on the channel with getting you fit and healthy again. <laughs> 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 ah, uh-huh, I love those. What, does the mug say anything spectacular there, Tony? Let's see, no, nope. you gotta turn it a little. Uh, I'd, I'd love to. Uh, all right. I'd love to stay and chat, but I'm lying. <laughs> I happen to know how Tony has a little alarm on him that Jill sets off when, or that Jill is aware of when it's time to leave a place, right? That's what you were sharing with me. Uh-huh. <laughs> two so hours and I'm out. Two hours and you're gone. Tony, we got some questions coming in, but before we jump into the questions, um, I, I'm just on an off chance that somebody has not yet seen your YouTube channel and what Tony does. Tony, introduce yourself to the Better Pickleball audience. Let them know who you are, what you've been doing. Tell us about your channel. Give us give us the rundown, if you would, please, sir. There is no way no one has someone not seen my channel. That's impossible, CJ. Just kidding, guys um, and gals. Um, you know, uh, Jill and I started into pickle a couple years back. Uh, we wanted to share information the same way you CJ, you know, trying to provide good content to the pickleball community. 
it's a sport that uh, Jill and I fell in love with uh, about four years ago. And, um, you know, we used to play tennis competitively. We actually met playing mixed doubles in, on a USDA tennis team together. I used to play men's tennis as well and uh, started playing pickleball and four years ago or so and haven't picked up a tennis racket in that time. And so, you know, we, we've, we love the sport. Uh, you know, I, I, I believe it's the – I actually do believe that this is going to be – I'm not saying it's going to replace tennis, but it is definitely going to um, – either be as big or perhaps even bigger than tennis in the future, maybe in my lifetime, maybe not in my lifetime. But I think this is the kind of sport that so many more people can have access to and not just access in the Kadima on the beach sort of way, which is fine, you know, just that, that kind of bop in the ball around way, but also in the, um, you know, I want to get better. I want to, I want to, I want to learn. I want to grow as an athlete. Uh, so, you know, you, and I'm sure you do too, CJ, where, you know, I've worked with folks who are, you know, 60 and uh, never, done, never done any type of athletic activity in their life, maybe walked or jogged or something, but never done anything that required uh, eye hand coordination, whether it's softball or soccer or something like that. Uh, soccer's not eye hand, but foot hand, but you know, nothing like that. And, um, and you get them in the pickleball and all of a sudden it's, it's not just that they're out there hitting balls. It's that they're out there, their mind solving puzzles, uh, their bodies moving around. I mean, I just, you know, I, I can't say nice enough things about this sport. And uh, so I'm, I'm dedicated to it as, as you are, CJ. And, um, you know, do what we can to help grow the sport. And I think uh, one more thing I'll mention is that, you know, one of the things that we miss, that, that our sport's missing for growth, uh, and I think it's, it's, there's more of it now, but, you know, we lack the, the structure, the infrastructure of a sport like tennis. So, like, you want to learn tennis anywhere in the country, you can find a pro, get on a court, and hopefully learn the sport. Pickleball, uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't know about you, CJ, personally, but me personally, when I learned, I learned at the, you know, rec center with the uh, folks telling me do this, do that, do this, do that. It turned out probably 50-50 right and wrong, you know. So, uh, you know, I'm thankful that I learned, but, but it was, you know, a lot of the information I got was incorrect information. So then you have to unlearn that information. And uh, I know CJ, we have actually have a video coming out this week that we're doing a, a together, to, which is to further explain the non-volley zone rule. It's just a nightmare. You know, you've been, people have been playing four years and don't understand the non-volley zone rule. And you're like, Jesus, this is such an important rule. So, you know, that's that's why we do in Do Pickle. And I'll keep on doing it as long as uh, I can and as long as it's providing value to uh, to, to pickleball players. Awesome. And you do. I, I Hopefully, if you haven't checked, if you haven't already checked out Tony's uh, channel, make sure that you do. It's the right there below, isn't it? In with the two pickle, right? All right. Love the logo. Love, love, love the logo. Okay. Um, so we got some questions starting to roll in. So let's get to some of those questions if we will. So the first one is a bit of a rules question. And I have to tell you, Tony, I'm going to give you this one. If you do not know the answer, I do know the answer because I recently had to ask this for somebody else. What have you got there? Are you, you're just oh, getting ready? Is it, is it about the rope? Is it about the rope? You do. You saw it already. Yes, ah. you did see it. You got it. I, okay. All right. So, man, you've been looking at the chat, dude. So here's, but here's the question for anyone else who met it, missed it. Hello, France. How are you? Good to have you here. Glad you could join us. Um, and I'm not sure if France would be a male or a female, but uh, is it legit to have a small rope on the handle of my paddle like I did in racquetball? My paddle slips out of my hand frequently. Okay, take it, buddy. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I, what I already, I already, I replied in writing, but I'll say it verbally. I'm unaware of any rule that prohibits that. Um, so you correct me if I'm wrong, CJ. I actually have always wondered why in pickleball we don't have that little strap on here, particularly how close we are to each other, uh, swinging this paddle around, and it gets hot out there. And uh, you know, I don't know if eventually it'll be a thing, but to me, it, it, because I just, I. I, I'm a tennis player, but I have played racquetball, and I think that little strap uh, in these with this size of a paddle makes sense. So, what's the rule, CJ? Uh, I think that's incorrect because you can't alter the paddle. And putting the strap on, since it's not part of the manufacturer, putting the strap on would be altering the paddle. Pretty sure. Can that's I make what... two two counter suggestions? Sure. I have lead tape on here, and I have an overgrip on my paddle. But lead tape is lead tape is covered in the rules. Lead tape is actually, I believe, right in the rule book, and gotcha. um, 
it, it, it does have to do with, and I'm pretty sure normally when I'm not sure and I get kind of this weird question type of thing, you know how I usually run it by. Don Stanley. <laughs> I get Don Stanley on speed dial, but I tell you what, here's what we'll do because you know what, guys, love Don. He will probably answer while we are still on. <laughs> Don, I'm my Don Stanley light up. Please, yeah, Don. we'll go, Don, Don. So what I'm gonna do, France, is when I give Tony another question and I go off the screen, I'm gonna text Don. <laughs> just to make sure that we are right. And the other one, uh, Dale, you can let me know. Sometimes uh, Byron Fresso, he usually stops by these as well. He might be found in the chat. So um, if we're speaking incorrectly, somebody jump in. Otherwise, I, I'm going to, you know, because you can't know everything, right? Isn't that the way it goes? All right. Okay. I have wondered about the ropes, though. I have wondered why we don't have those. That's true. I've never researched it, but I, I've always wondered, why don't we have the little ropes? Because would make sense to me well and and it was actually it was so france obviously said there for, that they played uh, racquetball as well and the person who asked me previously was a, a, a racquetball player i never played racquetball never was my sport um but yes that would make sense and i wouldn't think trust me cj you don't too. want to be in a little room with a player swinging a, a, a racquetball racket with, without a strap on it because the last thing you want is that thing flying into the side of your head so. I don't want it anyway. When Laura, told, so you guys know Laura Fenton Cavanda comes on the channel um, uh, often, and she was a world class racquetball player. And she said, Well, yeah, you know, when you're watching the ball and it's going 200 miles an hour, this is when it normally goes about 160. And then they went to altitude because we were talking about what altitude does to a pickleball. And she, they were playing. I forget where it was, but somewhere where this altitude, she said, Well, yeah, it made the ball go from 160 miles an hour to 200 miles an hour. And I went, Whoop. And you're supposed to watch it. <laughs> yeah, pretty fast. Okay. All right. So we're going to, we're going to get into this. I, I'll text Don while you're answering this one. This is from Lindsay. Hello, Lindsay. How are you? Ooh, I know you got an answer to this one. Have you been listening? You guys got to listen to his podcast. We'll talk about that later, but you were talking about this a little bit on the podcast. What's the best way to handle deep dinks to my backhand? That's a good question. Now there's different options there. The best thing if you can do it is to volley dink it if you can. In other words, try and intercept it. Don't let it get behind you. The hardest ball to handle is one that gets behind you, you know, that you have to reach back and, and pull forward. So the extent you can keep the paddle, and I'll bring the same paddle here. Well, you won't be able to see them too close, but the extent you keep your paddle in front of you and and you know can can intercept balls out in front of you, the better your shots are gonna be. There's actually a drill. Uh, if you go to our channel, there is a drill called it's I think it's called the volley dink drill. Do that drill with your friends. It's a really good way to learn how to volley dink. And, and what it does is it forces you to stretch your or to learn how far can I go? So how far can I actually reach out and make contact with that ball? Um, and then from there, then now you start dialing back a little bit to get to where you can volley it comfortably and then work on that skill. That's the easiest thing to do if the, it, is to get avoid the ball getting behind you. Once the ball gets behind you, you have a couple of different options. Uh, one option is the dump dink, which is basically a dink like you know straight in front of you. You can try that one. I like the middle dink there. Uh, I think the middle dink is a nice compromise between the dump dink and the cross court dink. The other option you can do there, although you have to understand that your weight is probably going to be going backwards or you're or you be leaning back, you can try a, a lob, but you have to really execute the lob. No, you really have to get into it because of your weight going back. So those are the options that I would try with the understanding that if I can, my first line of defense is, can I keep the ball out in front of me with a volley, not let that ball get behind me? Cause that's much more difficult. Ooh, cool. France, hopefully we, or no, I'm sorry. That was uh, Lindsay. Hopefully we answered your question. Uh, just a little shout out. Tony and I did a webinar, um, Monday? Was it last Monday? It's live on. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's been, like yesterday. I mean, it feels like right. <laughs> been seeing a lot of Tony lately, uh, even though we live on opposite coasts, right? Uh, we just did a webinar on uh, the non volley zone and uh, being aggressive at the non volley zone. So you might want to check that out. That is over on Tony's channel. 
and you will find it over there. We kind of got into that. We did talk a little bit about the dump dink and the middle dink, and mm -hmm. Tony and I have varying opinions on that shot. Um, and um, but yeah, so go check that out. And if CJ, you want that, some more that, info. Sorry, CJ. That that's one of the beauties of this game, right? Is that there are some areas of the game that are actually a lot of areas of the game that you customize to your type of game and what 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 skills you have and how you want to what your strategy is. Uh, I don't have any like fundamental problem with the dump dink. Uh, although CJ, I would say, you, you know, I forgot to add, you have that watch out for the Ernie too. Because oh, yes. I, was, I was watching a Scott Moore video and, and there was a dump dink and, and Scott jumped over and smacked it. So, but but the dump dink is a good option. The dump dink is a fine option. Even the full cross court dink. There's players that execute that shot perfectly fine. And okay, if you execute it fine, that's great. I, on the other hand, friends, I'm a, partic I'm a pretty decent lobber. I'm not as good as Stephanie Lane, who's the queen of the lob and she's a good friend and we thought we compare notes sometimes on that shot. But I really like the lob. In fact, this morning, I think you said Lori is on here. Lori, uh, Lori uh, I, was, I was working out with Lori and a couple of, of uh, friends of ours who were trying to get ready for a tournament. And Lori kept on getting pulled wide. And I said, and she was she was dumping in the middle. Sometimes it was good. Sometimes, you know, it would go a little high. So I was like, why don't we tr just try a lob? So the very next one, she gets pulled wide. She hit a lob. Not only did it uh, get her out of the problem, it forced the other team to get off the line. So it took us from a completely defensive situation, which is even, even regardless of what dink, whether it's dump or middle or cross, all that does is say, okay, you're not going to hurt me. What she was able to do was actually say, not only you're not going to hurt me, now you're in trouble. And we ended up winning the rally like three shots later. They were off the line. They had to move back, boom, boom, boom. And then we win the, we win the rally. So. Yep. Uh, so make sure you check out that live. And I also want to say after we did that, I shot a video on a drill that I used to work on the dump dink. And that's in the can mm -hmm. and it'll be coming your way. Not this week. As we said, we got a non-volley zone uh, video coming this week. and uh, But next week, that will be coming your way. Okay. Ooh, this is going to feed right in. This is, you're going to feel like I just popped this up to you. Okay. I'm at the line. I just so much pressure, you. CJ. I'm, I'm telling you, because you're going to get to talk about one of the things I absolutely love, love, love that you do on your channel. This is from Brenda. Hello, Brenda. Brenda wants to know, is it common to struggle to move from 3.5 to 4.0? Oh, <laughs> great question, Brenda. So you follow it. We have Project 4.0. You must know our channel. Anyway, um, the answer to your question is yes and no. I know that that's, I'm going to explain each one, so you'll see what I mean. So is it difficult to move from 3.5 to 4.0? Yes, but only if, 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 if there's two things you have to concentrate on if you want to go from 3.5 to 4.0. One is you have to have a clear understanding of fundamentals. And, and you know, I, I always, I, I'm trying to find a better term, but I haven't yet. Fundamentals does not mean beginner. So fundamentals does not mean you know, someone who's just learning how to play. Fundamentals means literally what I mean. So like the foundation of the game, you have to have your fundamentals have to be sound. If, for instance, if you're missing return to serve, if you're not making it up to the MBZ line, if you're not doing the things that are absolutely fundamental to a good pickleball game, then it'll be difficult to move from 3-5 to 4-0. And the reason is, it's not because you're a better or worse player, it's because the 4-0s are fundamentally sound. So you're going up against teams that are players that aren't going to give you the free point on the return of serve or whatever the fundamental uh, issue is. Th sort of a, a corollary of fundamentals, but not exactly the same thing, is to move from 3.5 to 4.0, it's error reduction. So you're focusing really on two things. One is, are my fundamentals sound, right? Or And actually, one of the things that I'm working on, and, and, and there'll be more of this coming out in the next, say, like two or three weeks. You'll get more information on this. But I'm, right now, I'm working on a diagnostic check, right, that CJ and I are collaborating on. Basically, you know, like six things that you can, you can basically check yourself, you know, sort of like a, like a health check. It's a diagnostic check for your game. So it's basically like check one, check two, check three, check four, check five, check six, make sure that those six things are good. If those six things are good, then at least that part of your game, you know, is going to be sound. And then you can move on to another part of your game. But the other part, like I said, is error reduction. The difference between a three, five and a four oh player is not really power. It's not really anything other than four oh's don't make as many errors as three fives less pop-ups, uh, less balls in the net, less balls hit wide, things like that. So the 4-0 the lowers their errors. Therefore, you know, they allow the other team to make the errors. Three fives generally are committing more errors, you know, per however many game, however many shots you want to think about, or how many shots in a rally. 
than a 4.0 team. So the two main things are fundamentals and errors. Now, to move from 4.0 to 4.5 and even higher, there are sometimes there are players that play without having power available to them at those levels, and that's fine. Usually, once you start moving up to 4.5 and 5.0, that's where you start seeing like eye hand speed, um, uh, power in the shots, things like that has more of an impact on the game. Uh, whereas, again, between 3.5 and 4.0, really the issue are those two fundamentals and errors. Wouldn't you say, Tony, that in, in terms of errors, though, as you move up levels, that's a commonality? Yes, you might add some new shots. You probably don't see a lot of Ernie's at the 4.0 level. I mean, you might see one or two. Mm -hmm. um, so you maybe add some new shots. But wouldn't you say that error reduction is one of the keys as you move up no matter what level you happen to be at? Yeah, I mean, errors are always an issue, but, you know, and that was one of the, the you mentioned the podcast, and I'll, I'll, I'll quickly plug it because I, I want people to listen to this, not to listen to me, but to listen to my guest. Uh, and actually, you were one of the guests, and, and that show is really fantastic, but I had the opportunity to interview uh, Coach Peter Scales. I got to meet him through a, a pickleball player who's an IPTT instructor, also a student in the academy, so, you know, we've, we've gotten to know each other, and her husband's a, a sports psychologist, or not sports psychologist, I'm sorry, he's a psychologist but he's also a tennis coach. So he's, he, he, and he thinks about this stuff all the time. And he's read all the, you know, all the books about tennis and, you know, all the psychology stuff. And it's fascinating. Uh, but um, uh, so, you know, he, he mentioned to me, which was fascinating that even if you look at like someone like Roger Federer, like 48% of the, of the points that he, that he loses are because he made an error. So, and he's the greatest tennis player in ever, right? So even that level still has, you know, errors are still part of the game. So yes, you always want to reduce errors. But what I see CJ is, and you and I have talked about this before, but like when you look at marginal differences or marginal advantages, right? So the, like the difference between a three, five and a four, oh, an error uh, generation is like this, right? The difference between a four and a four, five on error generation is sometimes just this. You know, there might be less errors by the four, five, but it's not this, it's, this and usually what the four five does is the four five overpowers four oh teams and you you know them too i know four players that don't make mistakes they don't make mistakes they 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 don't they hardly their third shots are going in they get their dinks are going in they don't miss serves they don't miss returns they're in the right spot but they just you know either their hand coordination sometimes isn't there or um they don't have enough power to overpower the four five they're playing and so they they lose the game not because of any they don't have any great discrepancy on errors right again Three, five, and four, usually the difference in errors is huge. Just like if you would say three, five, and three, oh, maybe even bigger. And, you know, think of like even a three, oh, that's been playing for, let's say, a year or two and a brand new beginner. Well, brand new beginner is going to be hitting the, spraying the balls all over the place and all kinds of stuff. Whereas the three, oh, you know, I have less errors. So, you know, to, to me, I look at it that way. Great point. Great point. Okay. Let's see. Let's give you another one. Okay. This is Janet. Janet is here a lot. Hi, Janet. How are you? Hola, Janet. Okay. What to do when playing an opponent with a clearly, this, we have two clearlies here, and one is all caps. <laughs> clearly, <Focus on> that. <laughs> but not on videotape, illegal serve. So frustrating. It's more mental than a physical, a, a physical advantage, but once it gets to be blatant, ugh. What what do you say? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you my my spin on 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 the serve. Um, unless the uh, serve uh, is unless the illegality of the serve is so extreme, right, as to create a competitive advantage, I don't worry about it. Like, I don't think normally the serves, unless you have somebody serving like sidearm and just ripping those balls in because they're able to serve it that high. Again, my personal view is it's just it just it, it just doesn't cause that much of a difference in the game, right? So if it's basically the same serve that they would hit, whether they were serving at their knee or serving right above their belly button or with their paddle a little bit, you know, above their above their wrist kind of a thing. My personal view is just move on and 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 not worry about it. Now, if they're slamming balls, you know, again off the shoulder, just cranking those balls in, and I've had that happen to me. I, I was uh, playing some rec games, you know, several years back, and I, there was a player that was just, he was just, I mean, he was basically acing everybody because he's just like, ram down the line. He was like, you know, I didn't call it, but because it was just a rec game, I didn't care. But there, like, if you were going to call it, I think you'd be like, it's the same thing, like, I, I, I say, CJ, the same thing I say about the NDZ line. Like, to me, 
nothing ruins a game more than an MBZ call that's not agreed to, you know, where the, where the other guy, the other players like, I didn't step on the MBZ. Um, so those like really marginal, like, like close MBZ calls, you have to be, I think you need to be, again, it depends on what your objectives are, right? But to me, I let those go. Um, now, if the person steps into the MBZ, that's a different story, right? You know, like a full step in or something like that. But those like really small MBZ violations, I think the same thing with the serb. To me, I let those slide. Um, you know, that's my view. Yeah, and, and I always kind of go back to one of the things that um, uh, you're going to have to help me out here because this I, this was in the podcast, in the, the podcast that you did with Peter Scales. And truly, I got to tell you, there's some great information in those podcasts. And Tony's been breaking them up in small, like 15-ish minute podcasts. Mm -hmm. But he was talking about focus, right? And focus, it, it came up where you were focusing on um okay i'm blowing this i'm kind of missing it but he was talking about focusing in rec play that that was the discussion You're... all right all right so so the idea there i got you there. The, the idea there and and just i forgot to mention earlier the, the podcast is called pickleball therapy you can find it on apple spotify it's on most of the sites out there i was told the other day it's not on stitcher but then i researched it and stitcher's only like two percent of all podcasts so you'll have to excuse me it's not on there but it's on apple spotify and like five or six other sites um what he was talking about, he's talking about how basically like, and, and I'm, I'm not going to say it exactly the way he said it in the podcast, because I don't remember the exact word he used, but the, the idea is basically that you think when you're practicing, you know, is when you're practicing, you're focused on thinking through the, through the game, right? Once you get into a competitive situation and that so, sometimes that's tournament, sometimes it's a ladder league, sometimes whatever it is, sometimes it's like just a competitive match. Like you set up a foursome and you're, you know, you're, it's, you know, you're, it's not that you're not always trying to win, but, you know, it's a little bit different level of competition going on in, in your mind. There, you basically feel or flow through the game. So you're trying not to focus on, like, the mechanics and things that you're doing. Like, the question before about, you know, the ball getting behind you, how do you handle that? You work on that stuff in, in practice, right? Um, so that when you have a game, whether it's tournament or competitive situation, you can, it's just more natural and you can focus on, on your you know, your, your uh, mental well-being, kind of your calmness, and you can also focus on strategy. You don't know, like, let me try this instead of that. You know, it's more strategy than, than, okay, my mechanics are messed up. So you focus on that in practice. There you go. Hopefully, hopefully that helps you, Janet. I, I would tell you this, the only time, now if it was in a tournament, would your answer be mm -hmm. different, Tony? The problem is this, and, it, and, and she pointed it out in her question. It is so hard to call an illegal serve without video. It is just, I, you know, people ask me like, in, in, they'll be like, is my serve illegal? I'm like, I got to take out my camera. Yeah, unless it's like crazy, like, you know, again, like shoulder, like, you know, because the, it's hard, even like like a, a famous one that happens uh, fairly frequently is Scott Moore gets, you know, questioned because he has that backhand serve. And so he comes at it and it looks like, if you look at do it with your naked, naked eye, you're like, oh yeah, that's illegal. But then when you, when you watch it on video and slow it down, you're like, no, it's not because he drops the, the paddle head and it's underneath, so it's fine. Those are so hard to call, um, especially in the heat of the moment. So it would have to be really extreme. The other reality, I think, and CJ, correct me if I'm wrong about this because this is one of those rule things. Um, you know, I think it's the same as the NBZ, isn't it? It's kind of like one of those, no one gets to really call it kind of a thing. I don't, unless you have a referee, right? In terms of the referee is different, but like, it's just kind of a thing, like it's a rule, but you know, there's rule no enforcement, I don't think. I, I don't know the answer on the enforcement side. I can tell you going through um, doing, you know, certified referee training, one of the things, and I was trained with um, um, Mark Pfeiffer. And one mm -hmm. of the things he said is he just, he talked about uh, serve calls and he said, you know, it's pretty impossible for you as the referee, even if it's brought to your attention, to um call it and and so yeah it is that that's one of those really unfortunately it's one of those really tricky situations and and it was i was goofing around what we were we were, we were shooting a serve video a couple of weeks ago and i remember don saying to me he says one of the things that makes it so difficult is it says contact must be below your belly button so oh, i can't see your belly button where the hell's your belly button right <laughs> I've heard that they, they might change the rule to where it bounces, right? So, you know, and I actually, I'm, I'm in favor of a bounce serve. I just don't, to me in pickleball, the serve is, I don't, we, we don't have time to do the 1500, the 1550 story on where the word serve comes from in tennis. 
But Google, if you're interested, it's really interesting. Um, you know, I played tennis for 40 years. They know what the word serve was until I don't remember. I was in England and I was at, and I learned about it. I was like, oh, that makes sense. So at Pickleball, we actually serve the original tennis serve style, which is just to, serve literally means just start the point, right? Just get going. Now in tennis, the serve is like a, a critical offensive weapon. If you don't have it, you're dead, right? Not in Pickleball. And so to me, bouncing the ball on the serve, I mean, why not? You know, it's a good, it would take it would take care of a lot of these problems too because the ball never going to bounce above your navel anyway. So you got it. Hey. All right. So we did get. So before you get your next question, we did get a confirmation from uh, from um, Don. He said mm -hmm. hi. <laughs> Um, well, and yes, it falls under rule 2E5A, so it cannot be done. And Dale actually pasted this into, Dale Voigt pasted this into the chat. Um, rule 2E5A says the only alterations or additions that may be made to a commercially made paddle are edge guard tape, lead tape, changes to the grip size or grip wrap, and name decals and or other identification markings on the paddle face. So, Although I would make one one observation, friends. If you're doing it for rec play, for safety, have at it. That's a, like that you wouldn't be able to use it in a tournament, but right, so, exactly. Yeah, in a tournament, you'd have to use the other paddles. So. Yep, exactly. Okay, all right. So let's see. We're going to go on to the next one then. This is from Threna Barrett, and I think you answered. I'm going to read this whole question, Tony. I think you kind of answered the first part of this question. If there's anything you want to add or you hear it a little differently than I do, please feel free. Um, but she also has a good second part. So the first part was, what's the number and difference from a 3-0 and a 3-5 a and a 4-0 player? And I think we kind of covered that one. Mm -hmm. But now she wants to also know, how do I learn anticipation of a shot? Do I look at paddle position or body position? You know, uh, that's one of those skills that it's fine to learn. Okay, and, and I, I, it, I always feel like I'm telling people, don't worry about it. You know, don't don't learn that. It's fine to learn those skills. I would suggest though that 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 skill or, or acquiring that skill, the the again, I'm using the term marginal advantage, right? The advantage you're going to get from working on that skill and developing that skill is probably not going to be worth the trouble, if you will. Excuse me, of learning it. And if you, if you know, we only have finite time, right? So I would spend my finite time on other aspects of the game before I spend a lot of time on that. Um, normally, I, you know, my experience with, with, with shots is usually, I don't know, you have like a sense of where it's gonna go based on where the ball is and kind of the tendencies of the player a lot of times. Uh, for instance, you know, I play with players that I know that they're gonna try and attack that middle. That's just because how they want to play. Now, it's not because of a particular foot position or anything like that. It's just, you know, they're going to attack the middle. Other players like to go cross court on the dink normally. So that's what I expect them to do. Uh, I can give you two kind of general rules if, 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 if my hopefully these will help. One is there's a, as a general principle, you want to always be ready for the bang, right? That's something that uh, Rob Cassidy, I did an interview with Rob Cassidy, uh, I don't know, a year and a half ago, so now maybe two years ago. And uh, it was a really interesting uh, way that he presented it, which I thought made a lot of sense, which is basically you're always expecting your opponent to hit hard. That doesn't mean they're going to hit hard every time. But if you think about it, if you wait for, if you expect them to hit hard, right? So you're there with your paddle and you're basically, you know, kind of like kind of like a groundhog or something like, is it going to come hard? Is it going to come hard? So you're basically waiting for it to come hard. Then if it comes hard, you're ready, right? If it comes soft, it doesn't matter because you have plenty of time to adjust. You know, you got five or 10 minutes to get to the ball anyway, so it doesn't, you're fine. If you're ready for a slow ball though, right? So you're expecting a dink and all of a sudden it gets sped up and gets thrown into your body or around you, then you're not gonna be ready for it. So being ready for the, the bang is something that's, uh, I think could be helpful to you. The other area where I think having some sense of what's coming at you is in out balls. So I'll give you some tips there. And, what you're, and, and we did a video on that as well. I think it's, uh, I can't remember. It's like let them go or let the outballs go or something like that. When I show you a sequence, I'm playing, and a friend of mine, uh, Tom, is hitting an attack ball. And what I did is I what I read was I read his how he was basically loading up. So basically he was getting down and coiling, like basically getting. You could see he was getting like some tension in his arm so that then he could he could hit a backhand towards me. And when I saw him do that, then I got up on my toes and got ready to get out of the way. And then when he hit it, I got out of the way and let the ball go out. So. 
that's an area where you can start looking at uh, body preparation for attack shots. Also, you know, swing, swing there is important. So like, you know, you get a bounce ball and you have the player take their paddle back. Uh, they're probably going to drive it hard. So what you want to do there is you want to absolutely pre-move and get ready to get out of the way and let that ball go out. Other than that, I think like, like directional shots and things like that, again, you can work on it. You know, you can look at things like, you know, obviously a paddle angle, body angle, weight distribution. But if you do that, what happens is there's players, uh, there's a player that I played at, and I can't remember his name is Casey right now, but he was a master of, you know, lean this way and hit that way. And it drove me insane, but, you know, it was very effective. So I would say focus on those two things, focus on uh, out ball, uh, body prep. Uh, and, uh, and what was the other one I said? I can't remember what the other one I said. What was the other one I said, CJ? I lost my train of thought. The histamines are messing with my head. No, you got it. You talked anyway, about out ball, you talked about ready, ready for the ball, ready for the ball to come fast. I, I, and it. I like that. Con I hadn't heard. I hadn't heard it put quite that way, right? But ready for the ball to come mm -hmm. fast is good. Um, so I'm going to follow up to that question. So, it, it, not just necessarily shot anticipation, but how would you help a player? And let's talk about like, especially because of Project 4.0, right? Uh, that three five burgeoning mm -hmm. four zero level player. How would you help them to get more court awareness? Um, yeah, you, now there's two different, a couple different things there. One is, um, uh, I'll try and address a couple different things. One is, it's, if you want to read something, learn how to read the ball coming towards you particularly, right? So it's really important. I, I find a lot of players have difficulty reading the type of ball that's coming towards them, how deep it's coming, does it have any kind of spin on it, and then being able to put themselves in a position, in the best position before the ball gets there. I think that's a really important skill to to develop, um, you know. So that's really important. If you're talking about um, court uh, awareness, meaning, excuse me, meaning left to right kind of uh, movement or you know angles and stuff like that, again, I'll, I'll, I'll refer to a video we did. Uh, uh, I think it's called "Cover the Angles." Actually, I used that board back there to do it, uh, and uh, basically I showed, you know, when you play pickleball, there's always going to be three angles. Okay, there's always going to be the middle angle or the, mid, the middle area, there's gonna be a down the line sort of a shot normally, and then there's gonna be a, a, a sharp angle shot. So you, if you look at the court that way, the key is uh, you never wanna get beat down the middle, ever, ever wanna get beat down the middle. So that is by far, and in order of priority, it's like up here where my hands off the screen as high as it is, it's up here in terms of priority. You do not wanna get beat down the middle because the middle is the easiest place for a, an opponent to attack, shorter net, Right, no wide, no out of bounds wide, only long. So you don't want to get beat down the middle. Second most important one is down the line. It's even though it's the second most important, it drops to here. So it's 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 the middle still way more important. Second one is down the line, and then down here because you can't really cover it is the sharp angle shot. So in terms of court awareness or court positioning, you always want to basically be looking to put yourself in a position where you can definitely cover the middle, and then try and cover the line for sure. If, you know, secondary, and then forget about the sharp angle winner, let them have that. A lot of that is also, you know, when you're getting ready for it. So let's say the ball's over, over to this side, I'm going to turn my body to where the ball is. What some players do is they stand, you know, square to the net the whole match and the ball's over, over there and the ball's over there and it doesn't, they don't adjust, right? So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're turning towards the ball, uh, wherever it is, and getting yourself in a position where they definitely can't beat you down the middle, let it be down the line. Actually, Hella Spar did a really good video, and I know you've seen it, CJ, because you and I have talked about it, on that the cones of coverage. So the cones of coverage there are middle, right? Middle's double covered, actually, right? It's really covered by the other player, but it's still double covered. Down the line's protected. If they beat you over there, they beat you over there. That's fine. I did. And actually, there is on my channel with Hella, uh, had Hella on. She did a live back in June, and there's an on-demand. So there's a whole live where she talks about that. And Dale will put that link up. And then I cut out a piece where she's talking about those cones. And because I, I do think that's that's extremely important. Um, I'm mm -hmm. going to add, you know, one of the things that I always do, because I don't necessarily, I mean, I played tennis, um, but, you know, but golf, you know, I'm a golf pro, right? I mean, that was my mm -hmm. game. So with pickleball, my focus is, is, is the ball as well. It's what you're talking about. And I'm just, 
I try and get fascinated by what the holes are doing, <laughs> right? <laughs> Trying to pick up what the holes are doing. And, mm -hmm. and I, I really try hard to, and myself personally, and, and as well as when I teach is to, to, to get people to focus right away, see when you can pick that coming up off the serve, right? How close mm -hmm. can you see that coming to you? Or when you're standing there at that non-volley zone, watching your partner get served too, are you watching what that ball is doing, right? Getting used to getting used to the holes. And the reality too is, you know, like a top spin, uh, you know, a, a, a neutral shot will kind of have like a, you know, pretty neutral path to it, you know, and then a, a Thompson shot normally will have a little more of a, of a hump to it. And then the cut shot will have a little more of a lower trajectory. Mm -hmm. Yep. And like Tony said, I think that's so important to start to read that <coughs> because bless you. Uh, it's so important to start to read that because that's what puts you into uh, uh, the correct position to to allow for the what's going to happen. The sooner you get the correct yep. position, the better, right? Yep. So, yeah. And, and right. one thing I'll say, CJ, is what I tell what I tell players is I like everything starts like let's think about it for a second, right? So you got a pickleball court, right? And then you're standing on top of the pickleball court. So the first connection to the game is your is the sole of your shoe. Right, not your body, not your paddle, not your head, nothing else. It's the sole of your shoe, so you have to focus on that. It, it's super important. Like I, I tell people, I would rather play somebody who has like a hundred percent core positioning and an eighty percent stroke than someone who has a hundred percent stroke and eighty percent core positioning. Because if they don't have good core positioning, what good's a stroke? You know what I mean? You have to be in the right spot. So right, reading those balls, recognize okay, that ball's coming at a certain you know height and movement. So I got to move into position before the ball gets here because otherwise I'm lunging or I'm late to it or I'm getting it too low and those kind of things that, that messes up your game. So, Absolutely. That's to me, that's the definition of anticipation, right? Is, is right. that's where the, and that's where the movement pattern starts. So, yeah, I can't, I can't do my, uh, I can't do my favorite back in, in, in golf because I think that's really important in golf. That's your connection. I used to hit a lot of golf balls barefoot. Right, kind of hard to play pickleball barefoot. Yeah. yeah, it would be painful. Yeah, it would be. It's painful. I, and CJ, sometimes. you want to hear the the, <laughs> the the worst? The worst? Yeah, right. The worst thing is I'm actually on uh, on two Sudafed right now. This is me on. Imagine with no Sudafed, I'd be like a mess. <laughs> well, you're forgiven. Thank Life you. happens, right? Okay, just want to give you the, this is a nice heads up. So Stan Brown, he had to leave. He said, heading to the courts now to work on CJ's warm up drill and Tony's how to counter your opponent targeting your partner. So I think that was the last video you put up the, last week, right? That's one of your newer ones. Yep. yep. Cool. All right. This comes from Brian. Hello, Brian. Ah, oh, we hey, were Ryan. talking about we were talking about this one too. You and I have been discussing a lot about pickleball. Okay. Playing against less athletic 50-year-old players, I have noticed a disguised topspin lob is highly effective. I never see any videos using this weapon. Why? They hadn't seen our latest video, CJ. <laughs> our collaboration video. We, um, yeah, listen, the, the having, so let me go, I'm gonna go back to what I, what I was trying to say earlier. So like, not trying to say, but I'll say, so I look at the game like, you know, you have to have certain building blocks, right? As you, as you build as a player, okay? Regardless of what level you're at, you know, you may come to the game from tennis or racquetball or some other racket sports. So you came already with like a toolkit and there you're going to build and maybe you have to break something down like the backswing and then rebuild it, whatever. But you come to the toolkit. Let's say you take a player that's just, you know, never played any kind of racket sport. So that player needs to build a, um, tools to be able to play successful pickleball. One of those is the serve, obviously. And so the serve... Initially, I view the serve as just being a very utilitarian shot. It's basically, I'm just trying to start the, the rally with it. I don't want to miss it if I can avoid it. I want to serve it deep. That's that's a factor that I'm looking for. Uh, but initially, I'm not looking for any kind of spins, anything exciting, nothing crazy. I'm just trying to get it nice and deep and get you know get it get them get it going. I and 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 what I say in the, in the video we did is basically you know the serve right there, right in the middle of that box every time, pretty much for the first however many, you know, first six months, eight months, year, whatever you're playing is perfectly fine. Once you're, once you're comfortable and you have your serve down and, you know, you don't need time to work on some other stuff, which like, for instance, you know, not letting four shots drop, not missing four shots, things like that, which are way more important than having serve variation. Once you're ready, then yes, 
adding serve variation to your game can add some uh, uncertainty to your opponents. Uh, it creates, you know, like anytime you can create stress on your opponents, even with the serve, like, okay, you know, what's, uh, you said it was Brian, I think, what's Brian going to do here? Is Brian going to serve me the high, deep topspin lob? Is he going to serve me a, a, a rocket serve? Is he, I'm not sorry, not lob. High, deep uh, uh, topspin serve? Is he going to serve me the rocket serve? Is he going to hit me a cut serve? Whatever. You know, that adds uncertainty. And anytime you get uncertainty to your opponents, it's an so Like, for instance, I serve with a power serve, a cut serve, a topspin serve, and I have a lob serve if I need it. So I can vary my serve. Uh, the only serve I really don't have, because I'm not a, just personally not a big fan of it, is the backhand serve. I don't do a backhand serve. But, you know, pretty much any other serve you want me to hit, I can I can hit. So, yes, definitely having a serve variety, if, if, it's, if you're ready for that to add to your game, great thing to add. And check out the, uh, the video. Uh, it's on CJ's channel. It's uh, we... CJ and I basically put together different types of serves and you can see that how to execute them, kind of get a sense about, you know, how they work. And then there's a corollary video uh, because we didn't have time to put it all in that video where I do the cut serve on, on into pick and serve. Which, and it feeds into what Tony was talking about before. You know, one of the things that he was saying, so we, when we were doing this serve video together, um, it's obvious there's a couple dis different serves that are our go-tos inside of the arsenal, right? You could tell to, right. you know, just by when I was watching the video that Tony sent me as I'm editing, I'm like, Ooh, you know, I, I like what he's doing in this, in this particular serve. And, but what that talks about is what a person's strengths and weaknesses perhaps are. Right. And mm -hmm. we were talking a little bit about that because we were talking about women in power serves <laughs> and how mm -hmm. that is, that's not as easy a move for most gals as it is right. for most men. Um, so it's not like you got to feel left out if you're a woman who doesn't have a power serve. You got to learn what's good for your game and what you can be consistent with, like Tony said. But here, here's what I see, CJ, like having a power serve, not having a power serve is not going to, it doesn't make or break your game. Absolutely. Not being at the NBZ line after return of serve breaks your game. It Absolutely. breaks your game. It, you can't do that. Missing four shots breaks your game. It just does. And then yeah, as you improve, like you want to be a 4-0. You can't get a third shot in. Okay, you're not going to be a four. You know that's just that's just unless you're very particular. You have such great power. You're you know Lee Waters or something like that. Fine. Otherwise, you're not going to be a four. You're not going to be a good four. So you know those are the things that like there's things that are critical and things that are like okay, I'd like to have a power serve. Okay, fine. And and, and you know I, I do want to say one thing because I, I always sound like I'm like uh, like a naysaying all this stuff. It depends on what your objectives are. You know if you just want to have a power serve because it's something that is a goal of yours, not go do it. You know, what, when we talk about project 4.0, we talk, what we're talking about, we talk about how do you build yourself to be the most uh, successful pickleball player you can be success being defined in that world, not exactly by just winning, but playing in a way that you have a higher chance of winning more games. That's really the, the, you know, so th these are things that if you want to win games and sometimes when I win games, sometimes I can be the most boring player on the court, meaning, I have no, no, no Ernie, no ATP. I've done nothing like, what, you know, but I also was at the, and I was at the no Wally zone line every time. I didn't miss my four shots. I attacked always in the middle, boring, but I win. So, you know, I and mean, again, it's not, and I'm not saying that's right. That may not be what you want to do. And that's fine. You know, that's, but you know, but when, when we build it, normally we're building to be as successful a pickleball player as you can. Like the bricks, right? <laughs> Just like that, like bam, solid, strong, like those bricks. You got it. Okay, this question is coming from Brian. Oh, it's funny. We were talking about this the other day too. Uh, I'm left-handed. Do you recommend stacking against players as low as 3-0 to 3-5 level play if your partner is a 3-0 or a beginner? I, I, I don't, stacking to me is not a level dependent um skill or not skill but uh, and, um, uh, part of the game uh, stacking is I think it's fine at any level um, if it's something that it's just part of the game so it's kind of like uh, you know hitting balls to one spot or another spot or whatever you know st stacking to me is a tremendous strategic value actually we're putting together a, uh, a master stacking class I always kind of joke that uh, I think I'm a pretty decent player but I'm a really 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 good stacker because I'm also left-handed and so I'm used to uh, playing stack. And so, you know, stack, counter stack, shadow shift, 
you name it in stacking. I'm going to talk about it because, uh, uh, but stacking is something that I think every, any player can learn. Uh, I don't, you know, it's not really skill dependent because, uh, you know, and I, I wouldn't worry about it like, uh, the, worry about the level of my opponents. Uh, you know, unless like if you're, you know, two four O's playing two three O's and you're stacking and stuff like that, you know, you know, use judgment. But but if it's a fairly evenly matched game and you want to stack, then you know, stack away. Cool. I'm just getting your questions, some of your questions mm -hmm. in there. People um, people like counter stacking is interesting because like people are like, what does that mean? And I'm like, counter stacking is basically like so stacking is the traditional. I'm, I'm so I'm I'm left-handed. I'm on this side, and I'm going to come over to this side, which is you know. So, so well, I'm backwards right now for you guys. You know what I mean? I'm going over my forehands in the middle. That's the traditional. Okay, I'm stacked. A counter or reverse stack is now I'm going the other way, right? I'm going to the opposite of what I would normally want to do, putting my backhand in the middle. Why you do that? You, there's several reasons, but one of the main reasons is because you're in a strategic, you're in a an alignment that doesn't work strategically. Uh, you know, the, the shot, your partner or you, the shots that you're having being forced to hit later on, like at the NBZ, just don't work for you. So you reverse stack. Uh, and sometimes you also reverse stack for uh, just to break the rhythm. Like say, say you served, uh, say you're in your normal position, so not stack. So it's an even score. I'm serving from the, 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 the right side, my normal position. I serve, my partner serves. I serve, my partner, you know, we just, we keep on going through side out, side out, side out. And we don't score anything, right? Throw on a stack even though it's okay backwards, right? But okay, whatever, just fit, switch it, you know, because you're not, it's not working the other way. So that's, that's another reason to, to throw in a stack once in a while is to mix it up when you've been serving and serving and serving and serving with no, you know, no effect. And, and I, and I love that. That's that, you know, even if you're, whatever type of stack you're using, as you said, if you have the person on the other side of the net guessing, what are they going to do, right? That gets in some. That just gets in their head. I mean, that's no mm -hmm. different than if 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 you're running up to the non volley zone and they're seeing you coming in. Part of that person's focus may be on you, and it might be enough to mm -hmm. throw them on. You get that same sort of result when you use the stack. So yeah, I agree. It creates uncertainty on them. So yeah. Oh, here, here comes one from Jim. Say hello to Jim. Hola, Jim. Uh, he wants to know if he can improve by playing lower level players, or do I need to play higher level players to improve? Um, you can improve with both. It, what you do is when you're playing, if you're playing a lower level player, then work on parts of your game that will allow the game to be a better game. Like for instance, when I'm playing, uh, you know, rec and stuff like that, I focus on my soft game. I try, you know, I'm not saying that if I get a, a ball up here and it's clear that I don't just put that away, right? But I'm not trying to push margins like I would if I'm playing, you know, my higher level friend players, you know, balls that are lower that I'm just, I, I don't like attack their bodies. You know, I don't, I'm not throwing balls into people's bodies off, off the bounce. I'm not, I'm not doing a lot of the things that I would do if I'm playing in a tournament or if I'm playing um, uh, a higher level game. So there's a lot of stuff you can work on. And and it sounds weird, but it, it, it it's, I don't want to say it's more relaxing, but normally you can just kind of just work, you know, so you're working on your things, you're working on an NPC lob, you know, things that are not going to be, um, not going to harm anybody. You know what I mean? Like being overly aggressive with a, with a player that's just not ready for it. So you can also work on transition. It'll seem weird, but you can kind of come in a little slower. Just don't be so obvious. You know I mean? Just work your way up so you can get a couple of shots through the transition zone, that kind of stuff. Those are all good points. I like to play a game with myself in my mind and say, I'm going to do this for the game, right? Or I'm going to focus on this, this tactic or this strategy, or I'm only going to hit for this whole game. I'm only going to hit the ball to this one spot, no matter what. I'm and that only goes going back to, to what here. you said, but that goes back to what you said about uh, coach Pete, what he said, right? Which is basically in practice, you're focusing on, 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 you know, you're thinking through the game and trying to focus on it so that when you go out and play, it's no big deal. One thing I'll do, CJ, is, you know, my, my forehand is superior to my backhand, so I will try and fade more to my backhand. Balls that I would normally, like in a, in a competitive or tournament game, I'm coming around my forehand to get them to them. I'll actually come around with my backhand and try and do something with the backhand just to use it, you know, just to keep working on the shots, you know. And by the way, I know you've all seen Tony's channel, but if you can't figure out why he's going forehand with this hand and then going around the other side, he he is the lefty. 
<laughs> I am. You got to watch out for that because I got to tell you, I can't tell you how many times when I first started playing pickleball, I'd be like three or four shots in the game and then I'd go, oh man, they're left handed. <laughs> I've had people after like two games, they're like, are you left handed? And I'm like, where have you been, man? <laughs> I'm like, I've been hitting balls off my left hand all for like the uh, last 30 minutes, you know? So. Oh, I'll just kind of laugh at that one. Okay, let's see. Okay, and this is good because you talked about four shots, right? You and I, have to, in, in, in you talk a lot about four or and or five shots, right? And so there was a question, well, what do you mean by four shots? All right, so here, here's another one. I just popped this sucker up and it is coming back hard. So tell everybody what that is all about, please. CJ, this is going to confuse people because I actually bat right-handed, so that's going to look weird. Anyway, um, so, you know, we when, when we think about pickleball, right, and and this is, I'm not talking about like five O's, I'm talking about like three fives, three O's, even some four O's, right? You know, we, we look at things like uh, cross-court dinking, okay, important, um, you know, pop-ups, okay, fine, whatever. It focuses on all of these types of things. When really the focus needs to be on the first four shots in the route. And so we are the way we express it is we say, get past four. If you can't get past four, then you never get into the meat of the game, right? You never get into the, like the super fun stuff, the trying to solve all that mess up there at the NBZ, the lob and whatever. Um, so, you know, you, you have to get past the serve, the return, the third and the fourth, right? If you're not getting past these four shots, again, you're, you're just not getting really, you're not really experiencing all that pickable has to offer. And if you watch a lot of rec games, right, and, and I, I, I would suggest players here do this, um, you can video yourself, it's easier, just literally, just take your phone, you can put it on a, on a fence, you can lay it on something, it doesn't matter, just, it, it doesn't have to be perfect footage, film a, film a game, and then when you're done, count the number of shots per rally, so just count, okay, this was, you know, two shots, four shots, and it has to be the successful shots, not, you don't count the missed shot, and I would venture to guess that most most people watching are not averaging more than four shots a rally. I may, I would venture to guess that a lot are going to be under three shots a rally on average. Okay. Uh, and so it's something that, that, that to me is the, it, again, if you want to focus on how do I improve as a pickleball player, the first thing you have to do is get past four, even though that seems mundane. It's just, you know, the first four shots, but you have to really tr focus on trying to get past these first four shots if you really want to uh, uh, progress in the game. And, and so let me go through them. So you got your serve is one, obviously. Two is the return to serve. Three is the what we call the third shot, but it's just basically whatever shot the serve team hits next. Usually some kind of neutralizing shot is a perfect shot, but it can be a drive, can be a lob, can be something else. And the fourth shot is the second ball that's hit by the return team. This is so you've hit the return of serve. That's two. Now it's their turn to hit a ball. Then when the ball comes back, that's the four shot. So, it, and it's normally supposed to be hit up at the non-volley zone, meaning you and your, your, your partners, uh, your partner's up there, you are returned, you've moved up to the non-volley zone, you're both up there. And that's, that's where you want to focus on hitting that ball. When I say a four shot error, I'm talking about where this team misses that fourth shot. That is a, a tr uh, that's like a gaping hole type of error in a game uh, compared to, you know, serve and whatever else. That's just a, a huge error that needs to be corrected if it's part of your game. Great. That outstanding explanation and definitely something that people can really focus on, take to the courts and really focus mm -hmm. on, on those types of things. We have a newbie in the house. Her name is Barb. Hello, Barb. Hola, and welcome, Barb. welcome to Pickleball. <laughs> uh, she wants to know, who determines player rating and do you self-rate? So maybe you can talk about that a little. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the reality of our sport is that uh, most of us self-rate when we first get started. If you want to, if you want to take a test for yourself, you go to the IPTPA website. So it's International Pickleball Teachers Professional Association. I think that's the right thing. It's IPTPA. Uh, go to the website and they have a, a ratings. Uh, uh, chart. You can get rated by the IPTPA. Uh, you need to find a certif uh, certified uh, rater in your area. Uh, you can get a formal rating, but even without that, you can download their the checklist and just you know check yourself against it and just kind of get an idea of where you're at. I actually I think um, ratings are are uh, uh, overstressed. 
in a lot of situations where they're not simply not necessary. Um, th- I know they're used, some clubs out West, I think use them to like assign courts and that's fine because I understand it, it takes away some of the politics of who plays where, fine there. But you know, if you're, unless you're playing a tournament or you're in one of those situations, you know, you're, I don't, like I personally, you know, whatever your rating is, is what it is. I'm, it's what you do on the court that matters, right? So if you're if you're able to play, you're able to play. If you're not able to play, you're not able to play, regardless of what number you know is being assigned. So um, I hope that answers your question. If you're brand new to the sport, um, I do have a book called Play Pickleball. It's pretty good. It has like some strategies in it, some basics on fundamentals on hitting and stuff like that. It's on Amazon. Check it out. And he's right. It is. It's a good book. It is a very good book. Uh, let's see. We got another one coming up. Oh, follow. This is a follow-up question. Somebody knows, wanted to know what you meant by shadow stacking. Oh, shadow shift. Shadow shift's a little bit complicated maybe for tonight, but basically it's not complicated, but it's think about it. Like the, the, this is the server. So if I'm, let's say I'm, this is my normal position, right? And if I'm stacked, this is the server. I'm going to come over here. Right. And then um, I'm sorry, if, if, if they're stacked, so this is my normal position. If I'm stacked, then what will happen is when I'm serving over here, this player will stand here so that I can slide back into my position, right? So this is a normal kind of a stacking situation here. So what happens is when you're stacked, if I go like this, right, then the, the opponents know that this player is going to move over here. So what can happen is, and we came up with it actually in a tournament Jill and I were playing where we were like this, and then the this returner was a tennis player, and he was able to really generate some power down here. So as Jill moved over, she wasn't able to, to really execute a good third shot. So what we did is we took myself, now this is me, I went behind Jill, and I told Jill where I'm going. I'm either going left or I'm going right. So in this situation, what I did is I, I the first time I went to the left, and then what happened is the, the returner, um, and I'm going this way because I'm pretending the course this way, but the returner actually saw me move over and then hit the ball wide because it, again, it just interrupted like GC and I've been saying, it interrupts their thought process. Like it's like, you know, instead of concentrating on hitting the ball off the serve, now the, the, the returner is like, wait, what's happening over there? And then they, he missed the ball. And then another time as an example, I went this way. So I went back to my normal position but he didn't have time to react so he returned to me, which is what we wanted. We were trying to take pressure off of Jill and get that ball from being slammed down here. So that's basically the shadow shift. Uh, if you wanna learn more about it, please uh, join us in our stacking workshop. Um, you know, you can uh, reach out to Lori, L-A-U-R-I-E and interpickle.com. And Lori, if you're still on there, send him a chat if you can so I can get hold of you. And we have a whole thing on stacking and the shadow shift will be in there. Excuse me. Cool. And she may not be able to post a link in there, but if you can, uh, Dale, that would be great. Lori at intopickle.com. Um, that way people could just click right on that email address. I know we're, we're winding down with the questions, but um, I think we got a couple more. Uh, just want to talk about, we've, we've got some more stuff coming your way. We've been talking about like a lot of stuff. So go ahead. You want to take this away, bud? <laughs> Sure. Uh, I mean, you know, CJ and I have known each other. Uh, we met maybe briefly before, but we really got to know each other during the summit. And, you know, we share a lot of the, obviously the passion for the sport. Uh, you know, we, we're both lovers of the sport. Uh, I mean, CJ, uh, uh, you know, if, if you follow her, which obviously you do if you're on this channel, but, you know, she, she or if you're on the show, but she, you know, she does a fit after 52. So, you know, she's seen the value of pickleball, not just as a wonderful sport, but also as a great way to keep fit. You know, like I told CJ earlier, I was going to have those dangerous things. She's like, you know, the fit after 50, right? I'm like, yeah, probably. But, you know, but it's important, right, to have to have to maintain a good physical conditioning and pickleball can be a part of that. So, um, you know, we've been chatting for, uh, you know, a couple of months now doing some collaborations, uh, you know, really trying to see if there's a way to uh, to add some value to the pickleball community. And, um, you know, so we're doing like this type of a thing. Uh, CJ was on, on my channel. Uh, we're going to do a few webinars in, in uh, uh, hopefully in like two weeks or three weeks. We're going to have some webinars that are going to be really exciting. We have very specific topics we'll be covering with you guys and gals. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's just really exciting stuff. And just, you know, be on the lookout. We're going to be uh, rolling out some more information. I told you guys about the six diagnostic thing CJ and I are working on. That's super exciting. It's just a way to really kind of formalize some of these concepts. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, you know, to me, like the information is sort of out there, right? But, you know, we're trying to say, okay, it's the information's out there, but how do we get, 
you know, a player to, to, you know, maybe like, like how do we structure it better for, for a player so that that player can get to the objective that they want to get to, which usually for most of, of, of our viewers is getting to, you know, not just 4-0, but getting to be a really, really good 4-0, uh, you know, like a 4-0 to be reckoned with, a 4-0 that when you, when, you know, when you show up at nationals or the U.S. Open or the regional, people are like, oh, 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 they're here, oh, oh, you know, and so whether you win or lose, it doesn't matter, but they know that you're a force to be reckoned with. And then, you know, if you can pass 4-0, and go to 4-5 and 5-0, that's fantastic. But, uh, but really, you know, to me, any player that becomes a solid, well-rounded 4-0 player is going to just have a blast playing pickleball because solid, well-rounded 4-0 players fully understand the game of pickleball. They play a fantastic game of pickleball. Again, the only difference normally in my experience is a little bit of pace. A tiny bit in errors, yes, but more in pace and more in, like, some of that kind of stuff, whereas – but they play pickleball and they can hang on the court, whether it's Kyle Yates, Simone Jardim, CJ Johnson, it doesn't matter. They can be on the court and not feel uncomfortable on the court with the player like that. So. Well, that's pretty funny. I, my name is not usually mentioned in the same s- sentence as Kyle Yates and Simone Jardim, but thank you. <laughs> always is, CJ, always. Number three. <laughs> We've got a couple more that I want to make sure that we get answered before we jump off. Um, how many videos do you have for Project 4.0? How many do you think are in there? I think right now there's probably like 50 or so, but don't, don't, uh, maybe, 50, yeah, 50 or so, but don't, um, I hate to say it, but don't like just limit yourself to, to those, those are like very, like respect the X, cover the middle, things like that, right? Those are in Project 4.0, but that doesn't mean that like there's not other videos, whether it's mine, CJ's, or even other content creators. There's, there's you know, really good content out there, so it's really, you know, you know, CJ and I, we love all the content creators and, and, and each content creator has something different. They bring a different way of maybe looking at something that may resonate with you. So check, you know, check out the stuff, but, but what you need to do is you need to identify what, what do I need? In other words, I, I, as a pickleball player, what is it that I need in order to get to where I want to get to? Do I need a block volley? Do I need an MBZ lock? Do I need a better third shot? Do I need a, whatever it is? Do I need better, you know, court awareness or positioning? And so what you want to do is you want to kind of look for those things. And that's why CJ and I, you know, that's why I mentioned what CJ and I are working on, which is basically like, can we take all of this, you know, information that's out there, right? And put it into like more um, organized modules, if you will, that then you could look at and go, okay, let me, let me, and they're, they're, they're incremental. So I go, okay, this one I, I got. So what about this one I got? Oh, this one I need. And now I, I spend my time here. And now once I get that, then I keep going down the list, you know? So that's what we're working on uh, to bring that to you guys. But, um, but yeah, Project 4.0 has about 50, 60 videos. So certainly please uh, take a look at them. Uh, but uh, just remember that Pickleball is very specific to you and to you and to you and to you. So, you know, what's, what might work for you or what you might need is not the same thing that this other person needs or other player needs. So be sensitive to that as you, as you look through, through the uh, content. Yes. And if you want to stay abreast of uh, the things that Tony and I have coming up, what I would suggest is you get on my email list. And uh, if you do, I've got a freebie, 31 Tips to Better Pickleball. Dale's going to post that link inside of the chat. So jump on the email list and we will continue to let you know what we've got going. Because I got to tell you, it's been super fun and we're getting some things put together that you are going to love, love, love. Um, Two more. Okay. Two more questions because they have been patiently waiting. All right, you 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 down CG, with that? I'm on ask. I'm on ask me anything, so it's you know, <laughs> anything like that. I'll answer. So I'll try to. All right, this one comes from Lindsay. What are windshield wiper dinks? Um, those are they're fun. You can do them. I honestly don't think that they're. Frankly, I think that they're a little overblown for under four five or five zero oh play. What it means is basically uh, you start here, I start, wait, who are you? You're here. You start here, I start here. Uh, and then what we do is we basically dink as we, as we come across each other, kind of like winter wipers, you know? Um, again, it's, it's fine. It's fine. I would rather, if you want to do a drill that works on dinking, do a drill. It's on our channel. It's called uh, El Zorro, kind of a cool name. And it's basically dinking like in a Z formation. And that'll really help because you'll move, right? You'll move left to right as, you, as you're approaching these dinks. And it'll teach you that middle dink um, because that, that, that middle dink will really help you sometimes move the, your opponents around and also get you out of trouble. So it'll basically, you go from the side to the middle, to the middle, to the side, to the middle, to the middle, to the side, like that. So a Z, uh, check that one out. That, I think it'd be, 
for most players, that's going to be a better drill than the windshield wiper. The windshield wiper is just a very sexy drill. If you want to see it done like in tennis, watch the look at the Bryan brothers do it. That's impressive because they're like they're volleying back and forth, and that's crazy. Is there anything that the Bryan brothers can't do in tennis? No, Ooh. I can do anything. All right, this is coming from Molly. Ooh, this is this is a good one. I was really targeted today when I played with a stronger player. How do you counteract that? I was really stressed. I held the paddle tighter and tighter. How do you stay calm and loose? Now, Molly, I don't know exactly how you're being targeted. If you're being targeted at the NVZ, you need to work, learn one shot and one shot only, and that's the NVZ lob. If you learn the NVZ lob, people will stop targeting you. So you learn the NVZ lob because what will happen is, you know, you get put in that position where you, the balls are coming, the balls are coming. All of a sudden, you execute a nice MVZ lob. That's no more targeting of you. They're off the line. Um, so, and the other thing you can try and learn, uh, it's a little more difficult, I think, the MVZ lob. Uh, I actually did a video on on targeting, you know, how to avoid being targeted, or not avoid being targeted, but excuse me, how to get the ball off of the targeted player. Actually, if you see up there, you can see the, the target's still up there. That's the one with the little circles. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the premise there was like the 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 – the quote unquote, the stronger player on the court would hit the balls in front of the targeted player, because usually it's harder for players to hit straight over the, you know, to dink over the net than it is to dink cross court. So another thing you could try and work on is you can try and learn how to dink straight. So what you'll do is you, know, you the ball will come and then you'll maybe you go middle once and then it comes and then you go straight now. And the idea is to make it harder on them to target you by hitting type of shots that that'll be harder for them to hit back at you. But the NBC lob, I think, if you add one shot to your arsenal, add the NBC lob, get good at the NBC lob, and trust me, you're not – well, I don't know if you don't want to get any more balls, but you won't be targeted. One other thing that I'm going to throw in there is when you're in that situation on the court where you feel your grip pressure getting tighter and tighter and maybe you don't have that NBZ shot, one of the things I always do, and I'm really cognizant of this in tournaments, take the paddle out of your hand right with use your non-dominant hand between <laughs> between shots i guess i should have said that right because <laughs> it's not going to do you any good when the volley's going on but take the paddle out of your hand between shots and just shake it out and try and get it loose and it starts to get you a little bit more awareness of your tension level it sounds like you were aware of your tension level because you knew you were getting tighter and tighter and tighter but that that little thing just really helps me as well as making sure I'm on the ball of my feet and I'm breathing. I really think about my body. If I'm if I'm getting stressed, and it's because I'm causing myself stress, back to Peter Scales, right? This is back to the mental mm -hmm. side of it. If, if, if I'm feeling stressed, I'm the one who's stressing myself. And I need to, those are my key factors, would be my grip tension, the balls of my feet, making sure that I'm really balanced. And those are things that. And can the, the other thing, CJ, I'll say about, about about releasing your paddle is because um, uh, I was trying to get Jill to do it the other day because she's been having some trouble with her arm. It'll actually uh, also help protect your arm from from damage. So what happens is, you know, a lot of times the the arm gets fatigued. So if you're holding onto that paddle, especially hard, and you just keep holding it the whole time, then you know you can see it's all flexed. So if I if I just if you just right take it out of your hand, it's a great technique for your health anyway, for your arm health. So yeah, definitely hundred percent. Cool. All righty. So it looks like it. Okay. We got one more. We got one more and then, right. okay. Sure. We definitely have one more. Uh, but before that, how does everybody find you, Tony? Where, 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 besides the YouTube channel, what else, how does everybody know what you've got going on? Um, the easiest thing is if you just make a note of this, into pickle it's on the wall too if you can see the whole thing it's into pickle uh we have into pickle.com you can email us on there uh mine is simple it's tony t-o-n-y at into pickle.com Lori is l-a-u-r-i-e at into pickle.com uh Lori runs our academy and takes care of organizing all of that uh stuff over there so she can help you get set up on uh you know like if you want to learn more about fundamentals we have a really good fundamentals course that um, you're welcome to go to our website and read the testimonials on there. You'll see the, the, the benefits it has for people's play. Check that out. Uh, but definitely interpickle.com. Uh, you can email me, email Lori anytime. Our YouTube channel, we're on Facebook. Check out our podcast. Get the book. I don't know what to tell you. I can't be out there anymore. 
and get on the email list so you can find about the great stuff that we have coming your way uh, uh middle of october late middle to the late of october some really good things i think we kind of covered this question but this person joined us so i am going to ask you one more time and if we have already covered it we're going to send you back in time because this replay will be up shortly it was any advice on playing down a level or two yet keeping the game engaging for the more advanced player yeah just have a, have a plan i mean we did talk about it earlier check that out this is a little more detail for you but just have a plan of things you can work on that are going to uh, help your game. Soft game usually is a good idea. Transition zone, resets, and things like that. Uh, keep yourself in the game. Keep yourself moving around, uh, you know, to make it more entertaining. And, and obviously, you know, you're not going to hit balls that are going to, like, blast the other team off the court. So, but check it out. You know, it's probably about, I don't know, 15 minutes ago. We have more yep. detail on that. Absolutely. Tony, I have to say thank you so much for being here, especially with, the like, the on the antihistamines and just life kind of... <laughs> life happens it is a pleasure to have you here i always learn something i have to tell you this when i hear you talk um, my ears perk up because you and i think about pickleball very differently i mean we think about it similarly we talk about it differently <laughs> and i am right. always i am always looking for these little tidbits of oh here's a new way to think about that concept and um I, I love it. I, I just get so engaged in, into what you say. So thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And thanks for being here today. CJ, thank you for everything you do. Uh, you know, it's been a pleasure getting to know you better and, and to share ideas with you about pickleball and life in general, you know, sort of the world and it's awesome. And so, uh, you know, appreciate everything you do and, and, you know, all of these things that you put together are really, uh, I think, hopefully helpful to players out there. And listen, at the end of the day, we're both in the same position. We want to see the sport grow. We want to see players grow inside the sport. Uh, and uh, one way to do that is to empower them with information so that they can go out and improve their 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 game uh, and uh, just enjoy this awesome sport even more and more. So. so if you notice, the cat's telling me it's dinner time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Tony. All right, everybody. I really appreciate you being here. I got Shirley telling me it is time for, we've been on this too long. It's time for her to get some dinner. By the way, come on back. First Tuesday of every month, November 2nd, we'll have another good one for you. If you are uh, looking to find out what Tony and I have going on, uh, we are, uh, make sure that you click that link that is in the, uh, that's in the show notes. And you know how I always end these same exact way together. We can train smart, live bold and age. Well, I hope you have a wonderful night, everybody.